welcome to Horror Babble. We're pleased to be back once again with a new Rumor collaboration series, Fringes of the Mythos, with artwork by the great Colby Dalstrom. Link in the video description. Every Wednesday over five weeks, we'll be sharing a selection of ghoulish stories with you. Five Lovecraftian stories that exist on the very edge of the mythos. Our first offering is a little-known work called The Crib of Hell by Arthur Pendragon. The true identity of the author behind the pseudonym is unknown, though several authorities on the subject nominate C. Hall Thompson, the writer of Spawn of the Green Abyss, as well as the third ghastly tale we'll be presenting as part of the series. The Crib of Hell first appeared in the May 1965 edition of Fantastic Stories of Imagination, and was described as follows. He could never erase from his memory the evil face of the child of horror, the loathsome thing that waited in the crib of hell. We hope you enjoy it. The Crib of Hell by Arthur Pendragon 1. What dark secret had driven Lawrence Cullum to the edge of nervous hysteria? What unutterable obligation had forced him to cry out for succour like an agonised madman? These, and other questions relevant to the desperate condition of the master of Cullum House, perplexed Dr. Nathan Buttrick, as he clucked his team homeward through Penobscot Bridge on the fringe of Sabbath Day in northern New England. In other circumstances he might have been dozing, lulled by the cries of the night hawks aloft, and the peace of an upland twilight. But now, although his body craved sleep, his mind was vitally awake. Dr. Buttrick was baffled by the peculiar malady which made each day a living horror for Callum. All the sedatives of the 1924 pharmacopoeia had failed to quell the anxiety which gnawed at the mind of his patient. In his frustration at the failure of the tablets and injections, the physician had even resorted to folk remedies, whispered by black-gummed grandmothers in the hills back from the sea. Infusions of tea and henbane, petals of amaryllis held under the tongue, he had tried all the high-country nostrums which once he held in professional scorn. They were as futile and calming calum as the most advanced drugs the age could offer. As the feeble lights of Sabbath day came into view around the granite mass of Gallowglass Hill, Buttrick reviewed once again the particulars of the case. Lawrence Callum, age forty-seven, afflicted with a cerebral aneurysm, a soft patch in a brain artery which might burst tomorrow, in five years or never. He was the last of the Cullum line, a prominent family begun by Draper Cullum, the leader of the 1706 expedition, which struck northward from Dunstable, to find, on an August Sunday, the protected harbour on the North Atlantic, around which would grow the seacoast town of Sabbath Day. The Cullums had always been influential in the town, yet oddly retiring. Lawrence was the most hermetic of the lot. Since the death of his sister, Emma, and the diagnosis of his aneurysm, he had shut himself up in the grey New England Gothic mansion at the end of Wyndham Road. His controlling hand was still felt on many of the town's business affairs, but this was merely the ghost of the man. His physical presence was sequestered behind the grotesque archway of Callum House, two enormous jawbones of a sperm whale, erected during the tenancy of the last patriarch, Captain Hugh. These facts, and the few pleasantries that Buttrick had exchanged with Cullum during the man's infrequent visits to town, were all that the doctor knew of the Cullum heir, before treatments for the aneurysm began. Except for the grim scene on the night of Emma's death, two years before— the physician had been in attendance, accompanied by Callum and most of the household staff. Buttrick would never forget the last words of Emma, spoken as she clutched her brother's arm in a white-knuckled hand. 
Lawrence, you will keep the guardianship? I, I shall, my dear, Callum replied as a mad, trapped look appeared in his eyes. Then the life of the frail spinster eked out its last heartbeat, and Buttrick's usefulness had ended. The doctor heard nothing of Lawrence Callum for a year and a half after his sister's demise. Then came the midnight telephone call. Buttrick rolled groggily from his bed, expecting a summons to the side of any one of three wives who were awaiting childbirth. Instead, he was shocked into full awareness by an almost hysterical voice begging him to administer relief. Although years of medical practice had somewhat jaded his sensibility to human pain, Buttrick heard a voice so filled with a frantic tension that the listener himself became afraid in an unconscious resonance with the pleading tones. He whipped his team across the surly Penobscot River and along Wyndham Road, guided only by the chill light of a three-quarter moon. At the end of the headlong ride he found Callum in a state of extreme anxiety within the mouldering drawing-room of the mansion. The earpiece of the telephone was still off its hook, as the man cowered in a great wing-chair, whimpering like an injured child in shocking contrast to the manliness of his six-foot frame. Although he was wrapped in a dressing-gown, Callum's trouser-cuffs bore traces of drying mud. Buttrick quickly administered the standard dosage of a sedative. It had no effect. The second injection calmed Callum, or rather removed the physical manifestations of his hysteria. But even as the drug subdued his trembling, Callum retained a spark of horror in his eyes. Repeatedly, Buttrick questioned the sufferer about the cause of his alarming discomposure, and each time the gaunt-faced Callum had burrowed deeper into the plush of the wing chair, mumbling under the sedation, "'Can't say. Mustn't say. No one must ever know. The guardianship!' Despite himself, the physician felt a growing fear at the recurrence of that ominous term, first uttered in his hearing by the dying lips of Emma Cullum. At last, the opiate calmed the man's chaotic nerves. With the aid of Amady, an aged Acadian manservant, the doctor wrestled the drugged weight onto a settee near the fire. He left a vial of tablets with the servant, and the assurance that he would visit his master on the next day. Then, Buttrick returned to town, exhausted physically, but unable to quell the incessant questioning of his curiosity. What event or obsession could explain the mental disintegration of Cullum? What arcane significance had that curious term muttered by Lawrence, even in his narcotic stupor? During the months of treatment which followed the first night-time summons, the doctor had learned little else about the trouble at Callum House. He had diagnosed the aneurysm, but was certain that his patient's extreme nervousness and loss of weight were by no means related to his physical affliction. Rather, there was some obligation, burden, perhaps something in the house itself, under whose presence the mind of the Callum heir was slowly crumbling. Besides the strange terms spoken by both Emma and Lawrence, there was one other fact which increased the peculiarity of the case. Buttrick had noticed that Callum always avoided approaching a large tapestry hanging in the drawing-room, another remnant of the patriarchy of Captain Hugh. The subject and rendition were unsettling at first glance, a highly realistic depiction of a witch's Sabbath. The naked bodies of cabalistic women were ruddy in the glow from a fire which also illumined a bleeding victim. After a few visits, Buttrick had inured himself to the grisly scene, but Callum would never pass within five feet of the cloth. Sometimes the doctor had the uncomfortable conviction that his patient was listening to the tapestry, as though hearing the wickering laughter of the coven. Gradually, Buttrick resigned himself to the frustration of trying to quell a malady of the spirit by chemical means—a difficult task at best. 
With such a secretive, uncooperative patient, it was almost an impossibility. Such were the reflections of the toil-worn leech of Sabbath day, as he reined his team before the weathered frame bungalow from which his father had practised before him. After stabling the horses, he ate a light supper, then willingly gave himself to his mattress with a side hope that no major illnesses or accidents would befall the populace of the village that night. His last conscious thought was not a prayer to his Creator, but a mindless repetition of the eldritch phrase so full of puzzlement and, in Emma's tones, a taint of evil, the guardianship. In late afternoon of the following day, Buttrick stood beneath the whale-jaw archway of Callum House, marvelling at the curving bone monoliths of this striking manifestation of the family's eccentricity. It was one of the two days of the week on which Callum was treated both for his aneurysm and for the frenzy attacking his nerves. Amity was waiting behind the door. He ushered the doctor into the dank coolness of the mansion. Once inside the entryway, the aged Acadian drew close to Buttrick, and seized his elbow in a surprisingly strong grip, a liberty he had never before taken. "'Monsieur le docteur,' he said hoarsely, "'do not be surprised if the master he tell to you some strange thing to-day.' There was a smile on the seamed lips, but the coldness of Amity's eyes removed all traces of amiability from his manner. It is some time now that the master, he has been saying strange thing that you should not believe. C'est la maladie. It is the sickness, nothing more. Buttrick was repelled by the servant's familiarity. During his visits to the house, he had found Amity a strange figure, given to eavesdropping impassively, as Callum made pitiful attempts at conversation with his physician. For some— Inexplicable reason, the presence of the Acadian always put Buttrick on his guard, as though the stooped valet carried with him a hint of evil. Certainly the man added to the foreboding gloom of Cullum House. Buttrick pried his arm out of Amity's grip, and strode quickly into the drawing-room. As was his habit, Cullum was seated as far away from the tapestry as was physically possible. He rose unsteadily, as the doctor entered the room. "'So, so good of you to come, Nathan,' he said, although his mind was on the verge of splintering into a thousand shards of madness. Automatically the air preserved the vestiges of a courtesy reserved for calmer spirits. Buttrick placed his bag on a richly damasked ottoman, inspecting his patient's appearance with a quick, professional glance. He was appalled by Cullum's decline since the last visit. The man was wrapped in a crimson sitting-robe that seemed made for a larger frame, so grievously had his body wasted under the bearing of his mental burden. The eyes were preternaturally bright, staring from dark sockets. Cullum nervously plucked at the cord of the gown with a hand which shocked Patrick by its resemblance to Emma's, blanched and with yellowed nails. The doctor had seen patients harbouring within them vile malignancies fall into such decay. But Callum's dissolution was the result of a mental cancer, which threatened to destroy both mind and body. It was moot which, soul or flesh, would perish first. Now the man seemed inflamed by a strange eagerness. He motioned Buttrick to close his bag, and cleared his throat nervously. I fear, Nathan, that I have not been the best of patients. All your medications, all your attentions, useless! He dismissed them with a wave of his blue-veined hand. Nothing will relieve me. Nothing can ease the weight of this hideous charge I labour under. Callum stopped briefly, and seemed to listen to the tapestry. Recovering his train of thought, he continued, Unless— yeah, unless I somehow ease my mind of this guardianship. He spat the word out in mingled tones of fear and loathing. Unless I tell the secret, I shall die, and the secret shall die with me. And if I tell the secret, the secret shall die, and I shall die with it. 
Almost a conundrum, eh, Batrick? A true gnomic riddle, eh, my friend? The physician rose to steady Callum, for his speech was assuming the peculiar cadence of madness. The man rallied, mumbling, Not yet! Not yet! In a moment, his face took on a grave cast, as he spoke in cooler, more ominous tones. You must have suspected, Nathan, that the cause of my agony was exceedingly strange. The aneurysm? He tapped his temple. It is nothing. We Callums have suffered more unusual maladies than that. My trouble lies deeper than the fragile flesh. The air paused reflectively, then continued. I, I have studied as long as I could, endured under this hideous burden longer than I thought possible. I am not as strong as Emma was, not so much of a Callum, perhaps. She was like my father, Captain Hugh, amazingly strong-willed. The secret of our family, horror, I know no other name for it, was safe with her while she lived. But I— Two years, man, two years of ceaseless anxiety, and the last few months have been a waking terror. Patrick had been engrossed by Callum's narration, but suddenly he started. A sound, a muffled moan or cry, had issued from the direction of the cabalistic tapestry. Callum saw the doctor's apprehensive glance. Not yet, my friend. Later you shall know all. For now, Nathan, hear me out. He flicked his hand at Amity, who was loitering in the door of the drawing-room. That will be all, Amity. Go to your duties. The Acadian shuffled reluctantly into the bowels of the house. When his footsteps no longer sounded off the flaking walls of the passage, Callum resumed his monologue. It is now time, Nathan, that you knew the well-kept secret of this house, for I shall tell you or die in the attempt. Only by sharing this intolerable weight have I any chance of keeping my sanity. His lips trembled as he fought to maintain calmness. It is not easy to disburden oneself of such knowledge, but I must, despite the warning, or I shall most surely go mad. Be patient, Nathan, and let me tell it in my own way. Patrick settled uneasily into a sofa. For a moment he felt a sudden impulse to deny Callum the opportunity to tell his tale. Why should he, Nathan Batrick, participate in this secret? His precinct was the body, not the diseased mind. With its austere inhabitants and wild setting between the forest wastes and the sullen North Atlantic, Sabbath day was eerie enough without compounding it by a knowledge of the secret of Callum House. But gradually, Batrick's professional instincts exerted themselves. If Callum did not gain some mental relief, either the torments he underwent would render him mad, or his aneurysm would burst under the strain. The doctor settled back and accepted a dark sherry from his patient's trembling hand. Two. Nathan, said Callum, have you ever heard the name Lygia? Lygia was the second wife, I believe, of your father, Captain Hugh, answered Patrick. Yes, if she can be called a wife. Immediately, Patrick knew the reason for Callum's bitter statement. The doctor had been only a child when Lygia came to Sabbath day. Yet the bizarre tales the townspeople told about her were preserved in his memory. After the death of his first wife, the mother of Lawrence and Emma, Captain Hugh Callum, had consigned his children to the care of a relative. He then embarked on his last voyage as master of the steamer Agunquit to the Baltic port of Riga. When he returned to Sabbath Day almost two years later, he brought with him the numerous spoils of Yankee trading— and a mistress for Callum House, the dark Lygia. Grotesque rumours about this woman soon sprang up amidst the villagers. Perhaps some originated in the mouths of good wives who envied her exotic charms, for Lygia was 
oddly beautiful, a tall woman, with a luminous eastern complexion, sinuous in her movements, heavily accented in her speech. Lygia's most distinctive feature was her long raven hair, of a black deeper than the northern forest night. Whatever their origin, the stories about Lygia soon were the common coin of conversation around the hearths of Sabbath day. It was said that she had brought the night hawks to Callum House. Before her coming, these nocturnal flyers had soared only over the backlands far from town. Now they roosted in the trees of the estate, trembling the night air with the beat of wings. More serious, some reported that Lygia had been seen on Valpurgis night, wantoning naked through the woods at the fringe of town. One individual who had been abroad at that hour swore that a glowing cloud had passed in from the sea over Sabbath day and that voices could be heard mumbling in strange tongues from within the floating mass. An ancient dame who dwelt alone near Gallow Glass Hill averred that Lygia had spent many afternoons with the few Indian sachems still alive, the degenerate remainder of the Pequot tribe. This nearly extinct race, it was said, held powers over air and sea. The more intelligent of the townsfolk, dismissed these tales as fantasies, yet all knew that Lygia exerted a strange hold on Captain Hugh. The gruff skipper was quite deferential to her in public, a far cry from his callous treatment of his first wife. There were some who even noticed more than a touch of fear in his attitude toward the tall woman whom he bore on his arm. However, in her public behaviour the woman was impeccable— haughty of mien, knowledgeable in the social graces, distant yet polite. During the couple's visits to town, she comported herself as befitted the wife of a moneyed landowner. Only a few noted that occasionally she exchanged knowing glances with the most depraved of the town's moral outcasts. A year after her arrival in Sabbath day, Lygia was big with child. At this time, Hugh Callum ceased his frequent visits to town, and seemed to enter retirement at the end of Wyndham Road. The village believed that he had secluded himself in deference to his wife's condition. Not a soul understood that behind the captain's bluff façade lay a spirit sorely harried by some knowledge which he could impart to no other person. Several days after her confinement was due to end, the news reached Sabbath day that both Lygia and her babe had perished in childbed. The father of Nathan Buttrick had been in attendance. In answer to the many queries, he replied that there was nothing he could have done, and divulged no other details of the tragedy. Nathan recalled that his father had been unusually silent for days after the event, as though meditating on some incomprehensible problem. Once, he had told his son that if he aspired to be a physician, there was something about the Callums that he should know in the future. But then the normal course of town life was resumed. The remains of Lygia were cremated and transported to her native land, as she had wished. The small casket of the child took its place among the Callum ancestors, in the family crypt. And Nathan Buttrick never heard the Callum secret from the lips of his father, for the man died of a heart seizure a few months later. "'She was a witch! Damn her eyes!' cried Callum. The air had become noticeably less calm toward the end of Buttrick's narration of the few facts he knew of Lygia. Now a torrent of suppressed emotion broke forth. "'And it is not dead! Do you hear? Not dead!' Buttrick leapt to restrain Callum, who seemed ready to run from the room. At the same moment, a hideous clamour issued from the direction of the tapestry, a scarcely human screeching, accompanied by thudding impacts, as though a body were hurling itself at the wall. "'It heard! It heard!' raved Callum. He swung around and faced the cloth. "'You cannot hold me in bondage any longer. The guardianship is at an end. At last!' An end! His final words choked off 
in a sob. Callum pitched into a faint on the settee. The vicious sounds from the tapestry grew in intensity until the cloth and the wall behind it trembled. Amity entered the room on the run, his features contorted with rage. Apparently, he had overheard the entire scene. "'The weak pig!' he snarled. "'He has doom us all. We are dead men, monsieur, dead men!' He vanished down the hall, his footsteps giving way to the grind of a heavy door being swung on its hinges. In a few moments, Batrick heard the crack of a bullwhip over the horrid ululations. A note of pain entered the screams. They tapered off into piteous whimpers until silence returned to Callum House. Batrick knelt beside the air, struggling to revive him. For a moment, he feared the aneurysm had burst, but the eyelids trembled, and slowly the man regained his senses. Ah, the relief, Nathan, Callum sighed. No longer a prisoner in my own house, no longer keeper of the vile heritage Emma passed on to me. Great God, Lawrence, cried Buttrick, what have you hidden behind that wall? I could not describe it, he answered. <laughs> Walk to the tapestry. You shall see it for yourself. Buttrick moved unsteadily toward the rich cloth, his breathing suspended in anticipation of whatever was to occur. Open the tapestry with the cord by your hand, directed Callum. The doctor grasped the weighted end of the cord. He closed his eyes for a moment, opened them, then tugged at the cord. The tapestry slid back smoothly across the wall. Beneath it, the wall was discoloured but blank, except for a small glassed orifice at eye level. Buttrick hesitated. He glanced at Lawrence, who feebly motioned to him from the settee, then fixed his eye to the peephole. A low moan escaped the physician's lips as his hand came up to clutch his throat. The orifice gave a view through the thick wall into a smaller chamber behind the drawing-room. Immediately opposite was a heavy steel door with a similar peephole and a sturdy grating at the bottom through which a man might crawl, were it open. Gnawed bones and a basin of water lay before the grill, which was apparently an opening for inserting food into the chamber. A greyish light emanated from tiny, clear-story windows along two sides beneath the ceiling. Knots of thread-like filaments, black, brown, and yellow, littered the floor. Crouched in the far corner was the tenant of this chamber, a spectre so inhuman that Buttrick's vision momentarily blurred from the shock. It hulked panting on its hands, a living human torso, if such a distortion of man's form can be designated thusly. Raven hair fell in hanks and tangles from a misshapen skull. Bright, feverish eyes glared out from beneath the shaggy brows. From the face, projected only a rudimentary nose, its nostrils dilating as an animal would breathe. The lips were tensed in a snarl, revealing discoloured teeth more like the fangs of a carnivore. The thing was naked, save for a ragged breech-clout tied about its middle. The torso showed superhuman muscular development, arms as thick as fence-posts, a barrel chest partly covered by a pelt. The lower extremities were piteously withered, dragging behind the upper body. Yet that monstrous form carried itself to and fro in the chamber with remarkable agility, supporting its weight on the arms and talon-like hands. As it lunged from one corner to the other, the creature sounded an ominous murmur from deep within its dark breast. "'Oh, my dear God!' whispered Buttrick, unbelieving before the grisly sight. He had seen men mangled by awful accidents in the logging camps, and even the pitiable distortions of infant bodies in stillbirths, but never had the physician's entire consciousness writhed before such a gross malformation— 
of the human body. He slumped weakly against the wall beside the peephole. What is it, Lawrence? he asked. Where, where did it come from? Now you realize the desperate burden I've carried these months, Nathan, replied Callum. That thing has been in our charge since the death of my father's second wife. It is Lygia's hell child. As he watched Patrick's reaction to the spectacle behind the tapestry, a transformation overcame Callum. He seemed more in control of himself, as though the sharing of the secret with another not in the bloodline had relieved a great pressure within his spirit. Seeing Batrick's revulsion, Callum had the presence of mind to fill another glass from the squat ship's decanter, and offer the stimulant to the doctor, who had moved slowly away from the wall like a sleepwalker. "'Sit down, Nathan, and calm yourself,' ordered the ear. "'I'm sure you must have many questions about our bad seed.' When Batrick had composed himself, Callum spoke volubly about the origin of the chamber-dweller. The doctor listened, as his host told him of Lygia's dying threat to the house of Callum. Unless they maintained her infant in secrecy until its maturity, they would perish. The guardianship, as she called it, must be passed from member to member. Only death could release a guardian— who was responsible for the care and nourishment of the creature. They would know, Lygia said, when the child no longer needed their protection. Captain Hugh Callum had always scoffed at superstitions and curses, but suddenly the occult had come under his own eaves in the presence of that incredible child, surrounded by a brooding evil even then in its infancy. He knew that he had not fathered such a monster. Gradually, the conviction grew within his mind that Lygia had consorted with a spirit of darkness, and that the babe was the token of their devilish love. Captain Hugh would allow the child no baptism. It was placed in the strong room behind the main parlour, a chamber which the guardians came to call, sardonically, the crib. From that time forward, the tenant of that dark room behind the tapestry was known as the Hell Child. And so, Nathan, if Lygia's words were true, then you are listening to a dead man. The guardian who betrays the secret must die, you know. Superstitious nonsense, cried Buttrick, who had recovered from his initial shock. Why, look at you, man. You're more relaxed than I've seen you in months. Now, Lawrence, I can't yet explain that thing in there, or— why it survived so long despite its grave malformation, but it must have a natural explanation. I admit that at first I was shocked. It's a hideous thing, yet I can see nothing that you should fear in it. Perhaps we can arrange for an institution to take over its care, relieving you of the burden. As to its being a hell child, really, Lawrence, I'd expect this type of thinking more of an upland farmer than the column air. "'That is because you do not fully understand the terrible threat of the creature,' cried Callum. "'It must be destroyed, Nathan, before it can commit more of its evil. It's just begun, I tell you.' Patrick put out his hand to steady Callum, who was becoming agitated again. "'What evil? What are you talking about, Lawrence? Do you remember that first night I called you? How frantic I was?' The doctor nodded. And you remember Rupal Oldham? Buttrick involuntarily winced. Oldham had been found lying in a foot of stagnant water near a fire road through Mohegan Swamp. Buttrick had signed the death certificate of the aged muskrat trapper. The body had been badly mutilated, and a look of utter horror was indelibly stamped on the face. You don't mean that? asked Patrick, pointing toward the wall. Callum nodded. It broke out, he said helplessly. We had underestimated its strength, and it burst through the wooden door, which the steel door you saw later replaced. Amity and I followed it as quickly as we could. It was dark. The spring grains had muddied the ground. 
Callum's voice became dreamy as he relived the gruesome event. At first Amity and I didn't know where to look. We stood in the drive, he with the bullwhip, and myself carrying the lantern. It could have gone off in any direction. But then, then we heard the nighthawks crying over Mohegan Swamp in the valley behind the estate. A terrible, fierce sound. They were swarming and diving as though mad. We ran through the forest on the fire road. The sound of the birds got louder, more shrill, until we could see against the grey sky the place over which they were swarming. I remember wishing that I had had the presence of mind to bring a pistol, but then the light from the lantern showed us its form ahead. Ah. Oh, Nathan, Oldham had come down to check his traps, and it caught him there in the mud and scummy water. When we ran up, it was feeding. Uh, Amity lashed it with the whip, and it drew back. I saw that we could do nothing for Oldham. The expression on his face, oh, terrible. Between the two of us, we drove the creature back to the house and into the crib. It was more docile then, feared the bite of the whip more than now. Callum paused and wet his lips with the sherry. But the atrocity so unsettled me that I had to call you for relief, or I would have lost my mind. We should have recognized this murderous act as an unmistakable sign that it was approaching its maturity, Nathan. But we thought the killing of Oldham was an accident, a, a chance encounter— no more than a month later, Arnold, my groundskeeper, passed away. He was the last of the servants, save Amady. At night the beast broke out again. I was awakened by the night hawks massing over the house. The coffin lay within the parlour. That thing had overturned it and was tearing, slashing. Callum clenched his fists in agony. Do you understand what I've been living with, Nathan? Do you wonder that my nerves are gone? Buttrick stirred uncomfortably. He was being drawn into the macabre web of Cullum's narration. The doctor began to feel unsafe, sitting only a few yards away from the tapestry. How many times had he entered the decaying drawing-room to treat the master of Cullum House, oblivious to the existence of a horror separated from him by only a few inches of plaster and lath? We then knew, continued Callum, that its ghastly appetite had been whetted. We realized that these events were not mere chance. The evil thing mothered by my father's second wife, I cannot call her my stepmother, had reached its maturity. For a week after we interred Arnold, it screamed. I shall hear its cries until my ears are stopped by death. Ravenous! ferocious howls which sounded even beyond the walls of the house. Amity and his bullwhip could not control it, and I stuffed my ears with cotton, took laudanum, drank myself into unconsciousness, everything failed. That hideous keening could not be suppressed. It was then, at the end of my wits, that I made the decision for which, if ever a man were damned, I shall be— I had to stop the screaming, Nathan. Do you understand that? Buttrick shook his head slowly, scarce daring to consider what awful revelation he would hear next. I ordered Amity. Ah, oh, even now I cannot bring myself to pronounce the words. Callum fought visibly to control his rising emotion. He sprang from the settee and paced the room. Amity, in addition to being my only servant— is also, he blurted the words out, custodian of the Sabbath-day burial ground. Do you understand my meaning? Then the bones in the chamber, and those fibres, hanks of hair? Buttrick asked incredulously. How many evenings have I slumped in that very chair, listening to that beast at its unholy supper? How often have I considered suicide, anything to free me of this vile guardianship? Even Amity has become infected by it. I truly believe he enjoys tending the creature and disciplining it with his bullwhip. He derives a sense of power from those duties. 
The old man thinks me weak and scorns me because my nerves cannot stand the strain. But what a burden! God help me, I am the protector of a ghoul! A long silence followed the impassioned confession. The room had become oppressively thick atmosphered. Buttrick opened the French doors, which led to a terrace, and thence the drive. The sky was yet aglow, and only the drone of frogs at Mohegan Swamp heralded the approach of night. The birds roosting in the trees about the house had not yet begun their darkling flights. The doctor turned, and addressed Callum. Is there any danger that it will break out again, Lawrence? The steel door has thus far resisted its attempts, he replied. Occasionally it hurls itself at the door for an hour at a time. Its ferocity is appalling, but the door and its frame remain fast. The air sighed deeply. Yet a mere steel door cannot be sufficient to hold such a malignant evil. It must be destroyed, Nathan, and quickly. I can no longer protect the town from its appetite. And now that I have discovered the column's secret to you, I feel that if we do not act soon, the thing will be at large, with no one to stop it. For it heard me betray it, I am sure, and craves my death. Buttrick was convinced. Now his mind no longer operated in accord with the civilized virtues of reason and mercy his own experience that day at Callum House, and his host's desperate words, had brought to life within him the savage's fear of the unknown. He agreed to assist in the extermination of the creature, and swore that no word of the proceedings would ever pass his lips. Since Callum assured him that he could spend another night in the house with the hell-child, Batrick decided to return to Sabbath day. On the morrow— he would return to the estate to plan the destruction and interment of the beast, for they would need daylight to dig its uh, unholy resting place. On the portico of the mansion beneath the arched jawbones, Callum seized Buttrick's hand in a firm grip. I only wish my father had taken this course in the beginning, he said. Then perhaps he— Emma and myself would have been spared the blight which has sapped our lives. He ran his hand along the cool ivory of the curving white monoliths. I know that, wherever he is, my father approves the action we must take. Buttrick nodded in silent agreement. He bade the air a good night, and turned his team onto the darkness of Wyndham Road. As he left the grounds of the estate— the nighthawks were beginning their evening clamour. Their rasping cries banished the peace of the autumn evening. Three. After his return to the bungalow, the doctor lay sleepless, distracted by vivid mental phantasms of what he had heard and witnessed that evening. Each time he closed his eyes, the scene in the crib flashed across the screen of his conscious mind, in all its loathsome detail. He could not erase from his memory the glowering countenance of the hell-child, a face so evil it seemed impossible that flesh and bone could be tortured into receiving the stamp of such malignancy. Buttrick could well understand why Captain Hugh had disclaimed parentage of the child. And now— Batrick himself had been drawn into the Callum horror. He had sworn to aid in the destruction of a thing which might still bear within it a spark of humanity, despite Callum's heated denials and the mystery of its parentage. Vicious, instinctively homicidal, yes. But was this enough, he asked himself? Enough cause to betray a greater oath? That one which bound Nathan Batrick to use his skills only for the preservation of life? It was a quandary, and the man writhed under the weight of his contradictory obligations. The doctor had thus lain staring at the slowly rising patch of moonlight on his wall for three hours, when the telephone beside his bed rang. With a sudden clairvoyance, Buttrick knew that this was no ordinary call summoning him to the sick bed of a villager. 
He swung out of the bed and snatched the earpiece from the hook. The voice of Lawrence Cullum dinned in his ear. "'Nathan, come quickly, man. We can't hold it. It's breaking out of the crib.' Over Callum's voice came the sound of splintering wood, and a ravening ululation such as never sprang from human throat. The telephone crashed to the floor as Batrick leapt to struggle into his clothes. He vaulted across the yard to the barn, scarce feeling the bite of the early hoarfrost. With frantic speed, he harnessed the team and urged them out of their warm quarters into the chill darkness of the road— where the moon hardly penetrated the roof of overhanging trees. Five minutes after the call, the wild-eyed horses lunged through the shadows of Penobscot Bridge, onto the gravel of Wyndham Road. Although the doctor was a good master to his animals, now he whipped them cruelly. He called the two mares by name, hurling imprecations foreign to his lips in an effort to gain more speed. Black masses of maple and oak lashed by, their sharp twig ends striking blood from Buttrick's face, when the sari veered too close to the road's edge. Twice it seemed that all, horses, sari, and driver, must surely fall to perdition, so headlong was their flight in rounding curves where granite outcroppings changed the road's direction. If a goodman of the town had been abroad at that hour, he would have crossed himself in utter terror— at the approach of the flying team and Whitman. It seemed an age to Buttrick, but at last the lights of Callum House glimmered through the thickets ahead. At the stone pillars which marked the entrance to the estate, the horses shied, nearly throwing the doctor from his seat. The whip cracked once, twice, but they would not enter. The team stood ready to bolt in the face of a terror which their senses could detect, even at that far remove. Cursing, Buttrick leapt down from the Surrey and made for the house afoot. The rains of early autumn had washed innumerable gullies into the clay of the drive. Several times he stumbled, almost twisting an ankle beneath him. Over the sound of his laboured breathing came a confusion of high-pitched cries— the nighthawks were swarming above the house in a dense cloud. Their mass eclipsed the light of the moon as they climbed to an apogee, plummeted suicidally toward the ground, then arced upwards. All about him the doctor heard the beat of their wings. Nearing the great house, Patrick saw that the French doors which had opened in another world, it seemed, were still ajar. The parlour within was lighted. Sobbing from his exertions, he lurched onto the terrace, and leaned against the door-frame. "'Lawrence!' he cried. "'Lawrence! Where are you?' The doctor's gaze slowly swept the room. The ottoman on which he had set his bag that afternoon lay on its side, the stuffing exposed through a long rent in the fabric. On the far wall, the tapestry hung in folds from one of its corners. Beneath, the discoloured area of the wall framed a gaping hole partially obstructed with shards of plaster and fang-like laths. By main force, the captive behind that wall had clawed and butted its way out of the crib. Buttrick stepped into the room, aghast at the wreckage of the once sumptuous chamber. From behind an overturned sofa, a moan broke the stillness, more like a sigh than an expression of pain. Callum lay crumpled against the wall, hurled there by the inhuman force of the thing, as it rushed from its confinement. "'Lawrence! Are you all right, man?' cried the physician. There was a deep gash on Callum's brow. "'See! See to Amity! In the hall! I—I I'm afraid it caught him, Nathan!' Patrick found the Acadian halfway down the hallway, which led to the steel door of the crib. The hell-child had seized him at his middle, and dashed him fatally against the floor. Beside the dead servant lay the bullwhip, a puny weapon against a force of such unutterable malevolence. The doctor returned quickly to attend Callum. The shock of the events could prove dangerous to the aneurysm. The weak spot of the brain artery might rupture from the slightest stress, but the air indicated dazedly that he was unharmed, except for the head wound. 
It went outside, whispered Callum. I could hear it scrabbling about on the portico before you came. Thank God it stopped screaming. I could not bear that sound another minute. Are there any firearms in the house? asked Buttrick. Only an ancient pistol which failed me. Callum pointed to an old handgun lying at the middle of the floor. I tried to fire at it as it came through the wall, but the mechanism was rusty from age. The beast flicked me off like a doll and went for Amity, perhaps because he took so much pleasure in whipping it. But it will return to finish me, Nathan, because it has now matured and needs its guardian no longer. Callum smiled weakly as a wistful expression fixed itself upon his pallid face. If death is the price of freedom from that child of the pit, then I shall pay it gladly, he said. Buttrick suddenly stiffened. Somewhere beyond the open doors of the entryway, he heard the sound of deep animal respirations. A growl loosed itself from a savage throat. I must close and bar those doors, the doctor muttered to himself, for Callum had lapsed into an almost trance-like state. He grasped a heavy poker and walked carefully through the hall. If it comes at me, he thought, I must slash at the eyes. The eyes! The main doors of the house stood thrown open to the night. Although it now rode the treetops, the moon illumined the steps up which Buttrick would have raced, had he not entered through the French doors. The cries of the ominous birds had ceased. They roosted in the elms and oaks, as though awaiting a climactic event. The doctor peered out onto the lawn, keeping well within the shadows of the entryway. Nothing stirred. He stepped into the doorframe, and quickly scanned right and left. Again, there was only the wash of moonlight on the lawn and long deserted walks. No sound was audible, except an occasional chirrup from the trees. Patrick exhaled slowly. It seemed that the thing had run off, perhaps to Mohegan Swamp, where it had claimed its first victim. This was work for a search party in the morning, not for a middle-aged physician unarmed except for a poker. Wiping his brow against his sleeve, Buttrick stepped onto the portico beneath the massive jawbones. The moon caught the whiteness of the eccentric archway. He ran his palm along the ivory smoothness, grateful for a touch of cool solidity. Standing there for a moment, the man seemed to gain strength from the contact of his hand with the curving pillars of bone. On the steps of the mansion, he took a final surveying glance over the grounds, unwilling to stray farther from the light. All was quiet. We will run the beast to earth in the bogs come sunup, he thought. Surely it cannot escape us there. Suddenly, the trees at the edge of the estate swayed at their tops as the nighthawks again winged aloft. The doctor's calmness left him. He started up the steps to regain the relative security of the house. But as he mounted the last step, his eyes caught a dark mass hulking at the very top of the arch, where the whalebones intersected. At the same moment, a guttural cry which seemed to tremble the entire portico peeled down at him. Buttrick's head snapped up. On the peak of the arch, balanced on its claw-like hands, crouched the hell-child. Its long, snarled hair cascaded down over the joint where the tops of the bones were clamped together. The fantastically developed shoulder and arm muscles knotted as the creature prepared to hurl itself downward upon Buttrick. In the split second it took his arm to bring the poker up, he realized that the thing had expected him to enter through the main door when he arrived in answer to Callum's call for help. It had climbed to the top of the arch, hidden there by the shadow of the eaves, in order to fall upon him as he entered the house. Then all thoughts ceased for Nathan Batrick, as he saw the macabre figure let go the top of the arch and launch itself at him with a bellow. The poker flashed sideways in a vicious arc, 
aimed at the point in space where the eye should have been at that moment, but it smote the empty air, for as Batrick began his stroke, the long, raven hair of the beast caught in the ironwork which braced the top of Hugh Callum's arch. The momentum of its lunge carried the hell child clear of the ivory columns. It plummeted downward for the merest fraction of a heartbeat. Then a terrible jerk ceased its plunge. It swung between the columns like a grotesque marionette, hanging by its own matted hair. The doctor could not breathe as he gaped at the frantic contortions of the creature. The cruel arms flailed and beat the air as it struggled to haul itself back to the top of the arch. From that brutish throat came a scream of incredible fury. The face grimaced from pain and rage. Flecks of foam spotted the snarling lips. For a moment, it seemed that the hair surely must part, unable to support such a weight. But then a report like a muffled gunshot stilled the writhing of that hideous form. Its neck broken, the hell child hung limply above the steps of the house it had terrorized through the long decades. Unstrung by the terrible self-execution he had witnessed, Buttrick fell to his knees on the floor of the portico. For minutes he sagged there, his fingers still gripping the haft of the useless poker. The trembling which shook his entire frame gradually subsided. Suddenly remembering the wounded heir who lay inside, he roused himself and entered the house. Callum was sitting as before, propped against the wall. His face was ashen, but his eyes glimmered with surprise as Buttrick knelt beside him. You, you're alive, Nathan, he whispered. Does the beast still live? The doctor quickly related the grisly death of the hell child. It was apparent to him that his friend was falling into a decline from which he would never recover. The aneurysm had been fatally disturbed by the night's events. "'Then I am free!' cried Callum. "'At long last free of that terrible presence! Ah, liberty! Blessed, blessed liberty!' The voice of the air trailed off in a final sob. Buttrick gently placed a pillow beneath the still head, and closed the eyes. The master of Cullum House, the last guardian of the Hell Child, was dead. For a long time the physician stood in the shambles of the parlour, trying to fathom some meaning in what he had experienced. Two corpses lay in that silent mansion. Beneath the whale-jaw archway hung the carcass of the family's child of darkness, claimed by this architectural whim of its first guardian. The grim sequence of events was too unsettling to comprehend. But now it was time for action. Impelled by some allegiance which endured even the death of the last Callum, the doctor resolved never to divulge the horror in which he had participated. Crawling into the crib through the broken wall, he cleaned the chamber of all traces of the hell child's occupancy. On the portico he cut down the monstrous body and loaded it onto the surrey. Batrick inched the surrey down the dark fire road to Mohegan Swamp. In a desolate reach of the bog he interred the remains of the vicious life which had brought Callum House to ruin. Only then did he call the Sabbath day constable. The account which that officer received was deliberately intended to excite no undue curiosity. As Buttrick told it, he had received a nighttime call from the air, requesting medication for his condition. Near the end of their conversation, the line abruptly went dead. Upon his arrival at the house, he found that apparently a burglar of considerable strength had slain Amady. Callum had been struck once— as the single gash on his brow testified. The blow had fatally aggravated his aneurysm. Foiled by the steel door of the strong room behind the parlour, the thief and murderer had broken through the wall into the chamber. But he found no treasure, for the room had not been used for years. No person in Sabbath day, not even the investigating constable, questioned the veracity of the doctor's explanation. 
Nathan Buttrick hid within himself the memory of that ghastly night at Callum House until death eased him of the woeful burden. Now residents of the village rarely speak of the Callum tragedy. Since there were no heirs, the great house reverted to Wyndham County, and was raised for its timbers. In the town cemetery, the Callum family crypt is sealed forever, and the Sabbath-day burial ground is a place of peace, embraced on all sides by the northern forest. But in Mohegan Swamp, the nighthawks disturb the twilight calm. They have inhabited the lowlands since the pulling down of Callum House. At sundown, while the main flock wheels and cries over the brackish water, a few night flyers roost atop a curious mound near the shoulder of a fire road through the swamp. Each year, the mound grows somewhat higher. The forest warden who first noticed the growth believed it to be merely a subterranean tangle of living willow roots sent out by the trees which overhang the bog. Yet the birds who frequent the hillock utter strange, fervid cries, as if urging on the evolution of something within the peculiar pile. It is unlikely that the mound will stir the curiosity of the townsfolk. Whatever phenomenon is at work will reach completion undisturbed. If you enjoyed listening today, be sure to subscribe to the channel by hitting the red subscribe button below. After doing so, click the bell icon next to the subscribe button to receive new content notifications. If you'd like to support our work and receive exclusive perks, consider becoming a channel member by clicking the join button below. To support us in other ways, see the video description for links to our Bandcamp and Patreon pages our merch store over at Teespring, and further information relating to our releases on Audible, iTunes, and Spotify. And until next time.